Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Dean Morbeck, Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, as well as Director of the In Vitro Fertilization Laboratory at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Morbeck will provide an overview of the history of in vitro fertilization and recent changes in technology that improve embryo selection. Dr. Morbeck, thank you for presenting with us today. Thank you for that kind introduction. I have one disclosure to provide, as I have research supported by Vitrolife Fertilitech, the manufacturer of a time-lapse instrument. As you view this presentation, consider the following important points regarding the benefits of embryo culture with time-lapse technology. First, how is the testing going to be used in your practice? When should the test be used? And finally, how will results impact patient management? The objectives of today's presentation are to review the history of culture methods in IVF and the development of time-lapse technology, to discuss evidence for clinical application of time-lapse imaging to enhance embryo selection, and to introduce additional benefits of time-lapse technology. When we look at the evolution of technology in other industries, we see the computer industry there has been a rapid and extensive evolution leading to the development of remarkable products, including handheld personal devices that are very powerful. This really all started back in the late 1970s. And this slide shows you what's happened with Apple Computer Series as an example. Remarkably, the birth of the Apple computer nearly coincided with the birth of Louise Brown in 1978, who was the first person conceived from IVF. As you look back over the past 30 years, we can compare technological advancement in IVF to the rapid change that we experienced in computing. In this slide, we see that IVF started with several different approaches, really creative solutions that we proudly consider as kind of a MacGyver approach. Embryologists would do whatever it took to provide good culture conditions for embryos, using big box incubators that are really designed for cell culture, but then incubating in different types of containers, such as desiccators to keep conditions controlled for embryos. A purpose-built incubator for embryo culture was finally developed in the late 1990s when a group in Australia introduced the mini incubator called the Mink. It then took another 10 years for this purpose-built incubator technology to penetrate the market and lead to several benchtop options. The time-lapse incubator shown in the upper right was introduced in Europe in 2008 and came to the US in 2011. Mayo Clinic was one of the first three groups that started using time-lapse clinically in 2011 in the United States. The quality of embryo culture varies significantly among the different types of incubators. The incubator on the far left is a standard cell culture incubator, really designed for culturing cells in large flasks. When that incubator is open and closed, it has to recover its temperature and CO2 and oxygen concentrations. Frequent excursions mean there are a lot of adjustments going on and it needs to correct the entire chamber. The incubator on the bottom right, a benchtop variety, gives much better surface connection with the culture dishes, facilitating rapid temperature control. Compared to the big box incubator, it is also has a much smaller chamber, resulting in rapid gas recoveries. The time-lapse incubator on the upper right is an incubator that has the benefits of the benchtop purpose-built incubator but also includes a microscope and a camera so we can watch the embryos grow while they're culturing. This is a critical feature, the ability to watch embryos grow without needing to disturb them. So why time-lapse now? Just like computing, there's a technological advancement cycle and we are just getting to a quite intuitive point for embryo culture. With time-lapse, we get more observations because we can look at embryos every 10 to 12 minutes while we don't have to take them out of the incubator. So we have a lot more information with no disturbance. By not removing the embryos, we expect we will have better development because every time we remove an embryo from the incubator, we alter the embryo's conditions and it therefore has to use precious resources to maintain homeostasis with its environment. We are now entering an era of time lapse where there are two to three different devices that are available in the US and there are at least two more that are on the horizon. IVF as a field now expects that this will be the way all embryos are cultured in the future. In addition to better conditions, 
Another benefit of time lapse is theoretically better embryo selection because we are obtaining a lot more information about embryo growth. With time lapse, perhaps we can pick which embryo is the best to transfer, resulting in better pregnancy rates. Some questions we are currently asking include, can we predict blastocyst formation? Embryo development and culture goes from one cell to more than 50 cells in five days when embryos become differentiated blastocysts. As embryos develop, we can transfer them on day two or day three, but many embryos stop growing between days three and five. So culturing them longer gives us a better ability to select potentially viable embryos. What if we knew on day two or day three which embryos are going to develop into blastocysts? Well, if this were possible, we could transfer them earlier to the more stable uterus, lessening their exposure to the laboratory. Another question is whether time-lapse can predict implantation or live birth. If true, then we would then improve outcomes with elective single embryo transfer by knowing exactly which embryo will implant, not just make it to the blastocyst stage. And finally, we know that even the best looking embryos can be aneuploid or have the wrong number of chromosomes and still implant, but result in a miscarriage. Can time-lapse help predict ploidy? Before we talk about the benefits of time-lapse, it's important to define early embryo development. This video shows an embryo viewed under time-lapse imaging. Here it's formed two nuclei, which show that the egg has fertilized normally. It then divides to two cells, then to four cells. Then it will continue to divide to eight cells on day three. If we could predict which embryo is most likely to implant, we would perform the transfer at that stage, but we don't. So we continue to culture to the blastocyst stage. Here the embryo has formed a tight, compacted morula and now is filling up with fluid and forming a blastocyst. Currently, a single blastocyst transfer is our goal because it represents the embryo with the best chance of implanting. By getting an embryo to this point, we have increased our selection ability. However, if we could predict which embryos on day two or three will make it to this stage, it would be even better to put the embryos back into the uterus earlier. A few more definitions before we move on to how time-lapse helps us in the laboratory. In this expanded blastocyst, the large mass on the left, that's the inner cell mass, will become the fetus. The cells that are on the outside and our small structures around the periphery are the trophectoderm cells, which will become the placenta. The first question we asked was, does time-lapse predict blastocyst formation? This debate gained considerable attention following the findings of a study published in 2010 that showed, with a very limited sample size, that there was very high sensitivity and specificity for time-lapse prediction of blastocyst formation. This report got our industry very excited with the possibility that we could do day two and day three transfers without needing extended culture. In this paper, the investigators used three different time points, but the main ones were the time an embryo would stay at the two cell stage before it went to the three cell stage, which would be between, for example, 7.8 and 14.3 hours, and then the time between three and four cells being less than 5.8 hours. The time it takes a two cell embryo to complete dividing to four cells after dividing to three cells is called the cell division synchrony. This report suggested early embryo development timings would be very predictive and of course led to additional studies. In one of the first follow-up studies, Conahan and co-workers found in a multi-center study that time-lapse did not predict blastocyst formation nearly as well as the original report. Sensitivity with time-lapse wasn't as good as traditional morphology performed by an embryologist, but it had very good specificity that was actually better than the embryologist. Going back to our question, does time-lapse predict blastocyst formation? It looks like there are benefits to time-lapse for prediction, but that they have to do with specificity and deselecting embryos. Thanks to time-lapse, we now know that there are on the order of 10 to 20% of embryos that are deselectable that would otherwise be considered good quality without time-lapse on day two or day three of culture. This is an important benefit but not as strong as what the original study showed. The next question we ask is whether time-lapse can improve implantation or pregnancy rate, an outcome patients are more interested in than predicting blastocyst rates. 
This slide presents a randomized control study out of Spain that showed that there was a 23% improvement in ongoing pregnancy rate with time lapse in a time lapse incubator versus a big box incubator without time lapse. Pregnancy rates are often confounded by the number of embryos transferred, so implantation rate is a better measure of improvement. In this slide from the same study, implantation rates also improved. Finally, the authors also observed a reduced pregnancy loss rate in the time lapse group. While these results are promising, the study has limitations that result in limited conclusions. Most importantly, the different types of incubator used is a critical difference that clouds our view of the real impact of time lapse. The differences between the two incubators are significant. It is unknown if the improvement was due to the incubator or the use of time lapse selection, or perhaps a combination of the two. Since this is the only randomized controlled trial to date, we don't know the answer to this question. It is likely that a large component of the benefit was due to the incubator and a small improvement from the additional information afforded by time lapse. If there is a benefit to time lapse for selecting embryos, it's in deselection of normal appearing embryos that have little to no chance of implanting. In this example, we show an embryo that divides abnormally from one cell to three cells, and this is called trichotomous or tripolar division. Note that the three cells have very similar sizes and shapes, and they all have a nucleus, so we know they're actually cells. This is not how we learned mitosis in biology, but it turns out that a similar phenomenon occurs in cancer cells and was described by Theodore Bavori in the early 20th century. While we don't know the cause of tripolar division in pre-implantation embryos, these embryos typically will not make it to the blastocyst stage and thus never implant. If they do make it to the blastocyst stage, there have been only one or two reports of successful pregnancies. Thus, time lapse has given us a window into a phenomenon not previously observed that has significant clinical implications. This slide further illustrates this point. Direct cleavage from one to three cells is shown on the top two panels, and the corresponding embryo later in development shown below looks quite normal. We can't determine if the embryo in the two lower two panels is normal without time lapse, so we would likely select it for transfer on day two or three because it appears to be a high quality. There's also a phenomenon called reverse cleavage, which we don't yet understand, but occurs when, for example, a four cell embryo cleaves to five cells and then reverts back to four cells. Needless to say, we have a lot to learn about pre-implantation embryo development, and thanks to time lapse, this is now possible. While time lapse appears to provide a small improvement for embryo selection, there are several other benefits of time lapse. It's apparent from the previous few slides that we have new knowledge with the observed abnormal embryo development. Another benefit is that time lapse provides a stable environment while providing more information than traditional culture. A somewhat unintended benefit is that we now limit the number of patients per incubator, whereas without time lapse, there are no industry standards and no limits to how many patients embryos can be cultured per incubator. For time lapse systems, typically four to six patients are cultured per incubator and door openings are limited whereas big box incubators have unlimited numbers of patients with a high number of door openings, resulting in longer recovery periods, thus negatively influencing the quality of the culture environment. To illustrate this point, I mocked up a big box incubator with random surnames. In this case, there are nine patients, but the numbers can be even higher in some centers. Since there's no industry standard, the number per incubator varies depending on the resources available to the labs. The unintended benefit of time lapse is a standard minimum number of patients per incubator. Another benefit of time lapse is based on research we've performed at Mayo Clinic, where we are working on improving the quality control assay used to test media and supplies for embryo toxicity. I learned early on in my career that lot-to-lot -lot variation is a concern in the IVF laboratory, just as it is in many other clinical and research laboratories. Variable product quality exists in cell culture, and since it also exists in the IVF lab, it means patient care can be affected adversely. Though we believe in our systems and issues with product quality are rare, 
we are still searching for a way to make this part of the process safer. This slide compares a time-lapse quality control assay to the traditional mouse embryo assay. The image at the top of this slide is of mouse embryos, mostly at the blastocyst stage, and illustrates the endpoint of the most common QC assay used to test for embryo toxicity. Here we want 70 to 80% of one cell embryos to develop into blastocysts by 96 hours of culture. With this assay, the endpoint is one data point, blastocyst rate, and it does not reflect the quality of the blastocyst, which is difficult to assess. All we can say is, did they make it to the stage or not? In contrast, looking at the bottom panels, you see we can look at specific timings of the embryos to determine if they're slower at earlier stages of development when they're the most sensitive to embryo toxins. This increased sensitivity is due to the fact that up until the four to eight cell stage of embryo development, the embryo would be surrounded by cells while it's still in the oviduct or fallopian tube, cells that provide a layer of protection to the environment. The only way we can easily detect effects at these early stages is with time-lapse. This slide illustrates the sensitivity of developmental timings, also called morphokinetics, of mouse embryos exposed to two separate lots of a product recalled by two different companies. The results from morphokinetics are shown on the left and the traditional mouse embryo assay blastocyst rate on the right. Focusing on the right side first, you can see that the control and the two lots that were recalled due to embryo toxicity passed the standard mouse embryo assay, which is why the manufacturers released the product in the first place. But when we take a combination morphokinetic model, we see that the assay is very sensitive and detects embryo toxicity in both of the bad lots. The final benefit of time-lapse I'd like to discuss today is whether time-lapse can result in better clinical outcomes not because of embryo selection, but because of better quality management within labs. It may also help to standardize the field of IVF. If we reflect back to that slide where I showed all the different ways we can culture embryos, that is exactly where we're still at at this point in industry, where every lab does something different and unique making it very difficult to compare outcomes or key performance indicators. Time-lapse would actually give us a platform to develop standardization. The final question I'd like to address is, how can time-lapse benefit quality management? By virtue of objective standardized timings, we are presented with the opportunity to develop robust key performance indicators, something completely lacking in the IVF community. For instance, how long should an embryo take to get to the two cell stage? Is that a standard and a worthy KPI? If so, then individual laboratories can start comparing themselves to industry KPIs in order to drive process improvement. Time-lapse really has the potential to provide the industry a lot of power to improve its quality management. A question every IVF laboratory should ask is, how do I know if I have a quality IVF lab? This graph helps illustrate the current state of IVF in the U.S. The x-axis shows implantation rate per clinic and percent of clinics is given on the y-axis. The data is for clinics, not patients, but it presents implantation rates for patients who are less than 35 years old, which is the best prognosis category in the group with the largest sample size. Like most biological systems, the result is a really nice bell-shaped curve where the majority of clinics fall from 30 to 40 percent for an implantation rate for the best prognosis patients. However, while there are some high-performing clinics, a third of the programs have implantation rates under 30 percent. Most leaders in the field recognize that these rates are suboptimal, indicating that there's a lot of room for improvement. In order to improve something, you have to measure it, and time-lapse could provide the tool to drive this change. Key performance indicators have been used in manufacturing for decades, but were only recently introduced in medicine. KPIs should be objective, not dependent on the laboratory schedule, easy to collect and analyze, and lastly, they should be sensitive and timely. Time lapse of embryo development meets the first three of these points, and hypothetically will provide more sensitive measures that can be acted on in a timely fashion. An example of KPIs that could be used currently without time-lapse are shown in this slide. 
The first two are early development factors, fertilization rate and cleavage rate, that are not very helpful for determining implantation or embryo quality. Early cleavage rate at 25 hours, which represents the percent of embryos that have divided from one to two cells, is predictive of the quality of a system and of implantation potential. It suffers, however, from being very laboratory schedule dependent. The best KPI we currently have is the good quality blastocyst rate, which is probably the most sensitive from a laboratory standpoint because we have a large sample size since every patient has multiple embryos and does not depend on embryo transfer technique or uterine factors as do pregnancy and implantation rates. time-lapse provides objective metrics to assess proficiency. In summary, what I hope you've learned today is that the introduction of time-lapse to the IVLF laboratory means technology is changing clinical embryology for the better. We are moving into the 21st century, technologically catching up with Apple and the rest of the computer industry. This technology allows less handling of embryos and ultimately improved culture conditions. Incubator usage is limited as well. While the jury is still out on how helpful time-lapse is for embryo selection, we know deselection is a powerful new tool for cleavage stage embryo selection. Benefits beyond the obvious, those that are yet to be realized but have great potential, include improved quality control testing, new knowledge, and a valuable tool for quality management. Thank you.